We're going to be introducing a new song this morning called That's Why We Pray. And, you know, when we, when we take the moment to pray, it's almost like going into a, a heavenly existence, kind of shutting the world off and just coming into a moment that's just not the same with no distractions and just going to your heavenly father and talking to him. Um, this song is kind of special because uh, when, uh, when I saw it, I, I realized, wow, we really go to our Heavenly Father for a lot, a lot of reasons. And this song reminds us of that. But also another blessing is it's because uh, I just got this song this past week from a girl that spent four months in the hospital. Her name is Marcy. She's one of our sisters in the Lord in the Canandaigua region, going to Calvary Chapel over there. And she texted the song, and I received it. And she just wants it to be a blessing to her church family here at Crosstown. And so let's all stand and sing, That's Why We Pray. To be thankful for the blessings of the day.
Well, if you're here for the very first time and you don't know who I am, I'd just like to introduce myself. I'm Bob Attagli. I see I serve in a leadership position here at Crosstown, and I'm always excited about Sunday mornings to be with my church family, but also even more excited for our first-time visitors that come walking through that door. So church family, can we give it up for them? Amen. One thing that I have fallen in love about Crosstown is this behind your chair there, we have the heartbeat of Crosstown, one of their heartbeats. It's called a connection card. And you can use that to put down any request or wherever you are in your journey, you can write that down, uh, something that you are looking for in your Christian walk. Maybe you wanna go deeper into the word of God, or maybe you have uh, something that's going on in your life where you just need uh, people to pray for you, or uh, whatever the need might be, we would like to encourage you to put it on this prayer card, the, I'm sorry, these connection cards, and these connection cards work. If you're putting a prayer request on it, we do pray for all the prayer requests at our uh, small groups, and we, again, we just want to encourage you, don't, don't go through this journey without all this help that's available to you. This is what this is all about. And also, if you have a praise, it's always good to God, give God thanks and let your church family know why you're thanking the Lord. You could put that praise on this connection card. And then we have greeters outside the doors there when you walk out, and you can make sure you give it to a greeter, or you can place it in one of the little greeter box or the connection card box that we have outside those doors. We're excited about Pastor Jeremy's message. We're going to see him on a pre-recorded uh, on the pre-recorded screen up here, and we are uh, we're just thankful he gets a chance to go out and do what he has to do in meetings and stuff. And so keep him in your prayer as he journeys. I believe he's going to a meeting. And um, but before we go much further, we want to draw your attention to the upper screens here on the Need to Know video. Good morning, Crosstown. I'm Pastor Ebert, and I get to serve as the Olean Campus Pastor, and I have today's Need to Know. We have a special service for Mother's Day on Sunday, May 12th. So invite your mothers, your spiritual mothers, and all those women who have made an impact on your life to this service honoring them. Kids Zone Kids will be singing a special song. Every lady will receive a bundle of chocolates, and we get to celebrate child dedications. Child dedications are a joint expression of a parent's desire to raise godly children and our church's commitment as a church to support you. So sign up for child dedications, send your child's name, their birth date, and a photo to info at crosstownalliance.com by Friday, May 3rd. Students in fifth to 12th grade, mark your calendar for an epic all-campus event at the Arcade Campus on June 1st from 1 to 5 p.m. We're calling it Dress for the Mess. It's going to be fun, crazy, and messy. You're going to want to bring an extra pair of clothes with you. Get your friends, and we'll see you there. Grease family, we have an exciting opportunity to partner with Mission Share Outreach Center to reach one of their 2024 goals. We are collecting all kinds of canned fruit, peaches, pears, fruit cocktail, applesauce, and so on. So help us restock their food market. When you go shopping for your family and yourself, pick up one or two extra cans and put them in the box located by the information wall. Mission Share will use this to help feed people in our area. If you call Crosstown your home, there are three ways that you can give. You can go online at crosstownalliance.com give or through the Church Center app or through the envelopes and the seat backs in front of you. We thank you so much for your generosity. Hey Crosstown, Pastor Stu here with my wife Amy. We have been married for 27 years, but it hasn't always been a Hallmark movie. Marriage can be a source of happiness and satisfaction, but for others, it's full of disappointments and sadness. It is crucial and important to invest in your marriage. Good marriages don't just happen by chance. We're so excited to invite you to our upcoming marriage event on Saturday, June 8th from 3 to 7 here at our RK campus. We encourage you to make a commitment to your marriage and register today. The cost is only $30 per couple, a small investment in your marriage, especially when you get a catered meal. Thinking of a friend who could be blessed by this event? Invite them. Better yet, invest in their marriage too and pay for their registration fee. This event is for married couples. It will sell out quickly, so be sure to reserve your spot today by going to our website at crosstownalliance.com and click on the marriage event or follow the QR code 
on the poster hanging in your foyer. We'll be praying for you and your marriage. We can't wait to see you here in Arcade on June 8th. Thanks so much for being with us today. Make sure that you stay connected with us throughout the week online on Facebook and Instagram. Have a great rest of the service. Wonderful, wonderful way. And in so many different ways that we just marvel. But one of the wonderful ways that he created us is that he created us not to walk alone. We have valleys and trials and tribulations that we face. And our Heavenly Father created us to walk with him or he with us. Let's stand and let's sing the song called Run to the Father.
God Heavenly Father like that. Amen. You know, one of the comforting ideas that we have in the Bible is that the Lord is our shepherd. Shepherd is one for protection, is one for comfort, is one for uh, caring. And uh, we know that we have the great shepherd that laid his life down for the sheep. We introduced a song a little while back. We want to sing it once again called Shepherd.
take a moment in prayer. Father, we want to say thank you for that wonderful truth that you are our shepherd. And uh, even like David described it in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When we hold you in our heart as you as our shepherd, we have everything that we need. And we just want to thank you that uh, you have welcomed us to come into your presence in such a way where we can lay down all of our burdens and find a rest that is offered by you that no other can give. So we want to say thank you so, so very much, Lord, for all that you have given us for your honor and glory in Jesus' precious name. And all the people say, amen. amen. Imagine standing at the starting line of a marathon, surrounded by a sea of people, thousands of people, each one with their own story, their own motivation for running, their own hopes and dreams for how they will finish the race. And as the gun goes off, you quickly realize that even though all these people have all their differences, there's one common thread that binds them all together. And that is the thread that each runner wants to run well and finish strong. You know, in a similar way, Scripture teaches us that the Christian life is like a race. It's like running a race. And that race is going to be filled with all kinds of challenges and hardships and trials. Jesus even said in the Gospels that in this world you will have trouble. We're going to have trouble. But amidst all the obstacles of the race. We need to know the answer to this question. The question is, what race are we truly running? Do you know the race that you're running? Or are you chasing after the treasures and pleasures of this world? Maybe for you, it's not the treasures and pleasures of this world, but you're chasing after something more important something eternal. And I think one of the biggest questions that we can ask is, do what we say we value most actually align with how we're living our life on a daily basis? You know, to be honest, I think the tension that many of us feel is that the things that we say we value most don't always line up with what we do with our time, how we schedule our time, what we give our money to, and how we spend our energy. In other words, there's a tension. There's a tension that exists between our values and our daily pursuits. For, for example, you might say you want to learn the guitar, but you don't practice. You might say you want to pass the test, but you don't study. You might say you want to meet someone special, but you don't shower. You don't wear deodorant, right? You, you might say, you might say, you might say. And you can say all you want, but if you don't learn to set your life and your time according to what you value most, it won't really matter. It won't really matter. And so as we continue our study in 1 Corinthians, uh, we see someone in Paul, a man who knew what he valued most, but he also set his life accordingly. In other words, his time, his energy, his money, his resources, everything about his life was aligned with what he said he valued most. For Paul, life was all about Jesus. For Paul, life was all about the gospel. And therefore, if that's what he valued most, everything he did in his life was determined by those values. Now, I recognize that not all of, not all of us are the Apostle Paul. We can't all be the Apostle Paul. I, I, I even recognize that as a, as a pastor. Not all of us are going to be called to be missionaries. Not all of us are going to be called to be church planners or pastors or preachers. Certainly, the first century is different than the 21st century. Uh, Paul didn't have a spouse or a family to worry about. I get all of that. 
But what we're going to see as we study chapter 9 today is Paul is going to show us and help us define what those values are in our life and how to discipline our life according to those values so that, and here's the big thing, so that we are running and training for the right race. Uh, Let me remind you where we left off last week because today's passage in chapter 9 is a continuation of what Paul just taught us last week in chapter 8. Chapter 8, if you remember, Paul uh, said that this phrase, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And he was referring to the situation that was happening in Corinth where some believers uh, felt like they could eat me, even if it was sacrificed to idols in the temple, because after all, idols really don't have any existence, don't have over the power over God, and meat is just meat. And then there was other believers in the Corinthian church that, that because of their conscience, they couldn't eat the meat because it would bring them back to their former life. But the problem was that these Christians who had the knowledge that meat was just meat didn't take into consideration the conscience of other people, and thus they sinned against Christ. And so Paul says, rather than latch on to your rights, we need to lay down our rights for the sake of others. That was last week. This week, he continues that thought by using himself as a sermon illustration to prove his point, which is usually frowned upon in the preaching world, but Paul does it anyway, so we're going to give him some freedom to do that. And he uses himself as an illustration of someone who lays down his rights. But you need to understand that Paul is not being arrogant at all. On the contrary, Paul wants these Corinthians to imitate him as much as he imitates Christ. That's the phrase that he uses in chapter 11 that we'll get to later on in the series. In other words, he's trying to disciple these believers to look more like Christ by having them follow his example. And the best way he knows how to do that is to show these Christians what he is doing with his rights. What is he doing with his rights? And he wants them to see that. By the way, when we talk about rights, we're not talking about what we typically as Americans think about as rights. We usually think about the Bill of Rights. We think about the freedom to assemble and to self-govern rather than be ruled by a tyrant or a dictator. That's not what Corinthians is talking about, and I think that's important to distinguish that. Certainly, we get a lot of our rights in our country from Judeo-Christian principles, but that's not the rights that he's talking about. He's talking about rights that we receive in the gospel. So, all that to say, today, I want to show you how Paul lived his life according to what mattered most and how we can do the same. So, Paul, in that sense, is going to be our example. So, first, let's look at, number one, Paul's rights. And I'm going to give you three points today and then chunks of the passage under each point because to read it all in one sitting is just too much to handle. We're going to break it up and hopefully by breaking it up, it'll help us follow Paul's train of thought. So the first 14 verses of chapter nine say this. Paul says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus which is actually one of the requirements to be an apostle. According to scripture, you had to have seen Jesus. Paul didn't see uh, Jesus alive in this earth when he was here, but after the resurrection and ascension, Jesus introduced himself to Paul on the road to Damascus. So he's an apostle, and he's making his case, and he says, are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least, uh, an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal. In other words, you, church, are the proof of the pudding that I am an apostle. Uh, you are the seal of the in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Verse 4 says, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Uh, do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? He's just laying on the sarcasm. And then he says in verse 7, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Which, I mean, if you think about the logic of that, that makes sense. If you enlist in the army, you don't have to buy your own gun, right? God forbid if you enlist in the Air Force, you had to buy your own plane for $60 million. You wouldn't do that. That wouldn't make sense. And so follow his train of thought. He says, who plants a vineyard without eating of its own fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same thing? And then he's going to quote the law, for it is written in the law of Moses. 
Uh, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Now, get what's happening here. Uh, they would process the, the wheat, and one of the ways that they would separate the shaft from the grain was they would put it on the threshing floor and have an oxen just walk in circles all day, tiring for the oxen. And so the, the, the rationale here is if you're going to have an oxen walk around all day, crushing the, the wheat so that the shaft and the grain can be separated when they throw it up in the air and the wind blows the shaft away and the, the, the grain is left, then at least let the oxen enjoy some of the fruit of its labor. But then he says, if, is it for the oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope and sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel, which... I find this whole section, I find a little bit ironic considering what Paul ultimately tells us what to do with our rights uh, in chapter 8 and then chapter 9 by building a case for his rights as an apostle. The first 14 verses, after he just gets done in chapter 8 to say, don't take use of your rights, he says, but these are my rights. That's a little ironic. Um, and remember, he just finished telling the Corinthians that they should not use their rights or freedom in a way that wounds someone else's conscience. Uh, that's verse 12 of chapter 8. He just finished telling them that they should not use their rights if it means causing another brother to stumble in, in the Lord. That's verse 13 of chapter 8. And then what does he do? He appeals to his rights, which seems a little odd. So what's going on there? Well, in order to understand that, you got to understand what the rights were. So what were Paul's rights? Well, we just read them. Uh, we just read them. First, he says he has the right to eat and to drink, meaning, going back to chapter 8, he had the right to eat the meat that was sacrificed to idols, but also it means that he has the right to eat and drink, meaning making a living and putting food on the table as a result of sharing the gospel. In other words, being supported by the church. Um, he had the right to take along a spouse uh, with him on his ministry endeavors. Now, we know that Paul was not married as, as Peter was, but his point is, if I was married, I could take up the same rights as Peter did, and I could bring along a believing wife with me as I go about my ministry, uh, and for him to actually have his family provided for, his wife and his family provided for as they did ministry. Um, and then finally, he, he had the right to refrain from working for a living because as we all know pastors only work one day a week right one hour a week for the sermon uh, maybe two hours if there's two services it gets really busy sometimes for a pastor of course i kid that's a pastor joke but what paul is talking about here you need to understand is working hard labor or putting your hand to the plow and working uh, in a field that requires you to use your hands and work hard. He, he had the right, Paul says, to refrain from that kind of work. Why? So that his focus could be on planting churches, making disciples, preaching the gospel, raising up leaders. That was his focus. And so he had the right, how? According to the law. Uh, Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, talks about that whole example of the oxen treading out the grain. And if that weren't enough, if Moses weren't enough, Jesus even himself said the same thing in Luke chapter 10. Look at verse 7. And here's the right, to be financially supported by those he served spiritually. To be supported financially by those he served spiritually. So Paul had rights. He had rights. But as I said last week, the, the question is not how can I exercise my rights, but how can I serve others in my life? Freedom. You, you might have rights, but if that's your focus, you're getting it all wrong. The focus should be how can you serve others in your freedom. So that leads to the next thing I think we see in Paul's life as an example, and that is Paul's surrender. Paul's surrender. Uh, he says in verses 15 through 18, this next chunk of scripture that we'll look at, he says, but I have made no use 
of any of those rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. Now you need to understand before I read the next verse, there were other churches that were providing for Paul. He was also a tent maker in Corinth with Priscilla and Aquila, but he had churches like the Philippian church and other churches that were actually providing for his needs. But for the Corinthian church, he did not want to take care of that right because it would put a stumbling block in those people receiving the gospel. So for, he says, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necess- necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if, I do, if, I not, if, if not of my own will, I am still entrusted, I'm still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as to not make full use of my right in the gospel. Again, Paul had rights. He had rights, putting food on the table, bringing along a wife, supporting a family, making a living in ministry. But instead of making use of those rights, here's what he does. He surrendered them. He surrendered them. In fact, he says, I would rather die. I would rather die than not have the ground for boasting. Uh, Boasting in that sense, you need to understand, is that being able to um, serve the Corinthians with no strings attached. The ability to do that, that's what he was um, boasting in. Now understand this, in no way is Paul boasting in himself, and we know that because of the very next sentence says this. He says, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. No ground for boasting, meaning the only ground that Paul would ever boast on, and the only ground that we could ever boast on, is the ground that is at the foot of the cross. In Christ is where we find our boast. See, Paul was so compelled by what Christ had done for him. Paul was so compelled by what the the church uh, meant to, to God and so compelled by the gospel that he was willing to leverage his entire life so that others could come to know Jesus. That's where he found his boast. And so he had to do this. He had to preach the gospel. Literally, as he says, necessity, necessity was laid upon him. And I think it was Charles Spurgeon who once said something like this, if he could do anything else in the world, anything else in the world other than pastor or preach, do it. (laughs) That's always made me laugh. Do it. Uh, What Spurgeon was alluding to, of course, was what Paul is saying in verse 16, for necessity is laid upon me. He couldn't do anything else. He had to preach the gospel. I hope our church knows that there's a certain compulsion a certain necessity that a pastor feels in his heart uh, when they're called to, uh, when they have the, the, the calling of Christ on their life. Trust me, there have been hard days in my life in ministry where I wish this wasn't the case. There have been days as a um, quote unquote prophet that I wish I could get out of the non profit world, um, go into the non profit world, if you know what I mean, non for profit world, pun intended. Um, it would have been way more convenient. If, if that were the case, but I can't, I can't, because this is a calling, this is a necessity, and the same is true for our campus pastors as well. Paul knew he had been entrusted with a calling, and he knew that he needed to steward that calling well, and the way he did that was to not make full use of his rights, but to become a servant to all, and in that sense, in that sense, we're all called to that type of surrender. And now your surrender might look like, uh, not look like the Apostle Paul's. It might not look like mine. But the point is, and the principle remains the same, that, that we're called to surrender, to, to not make full use of our rights, especially if by making full use of our rights, we prevent others from receiving and hearing the gospel. So we have to surrender to what God wants us to do. That's the second thing that we learn from Paul's example. And the third thing that we see is this, Paul's ministry. Paul's ministry. He says in 1 Corinthians 19 through 23, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. Listen to what he says. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I'm not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. 
to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. Then he says to the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people, that by all possible means I might save some. And I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessings. Paul lays down his rights so that other people could be won to Christ for the sake of the gospel. Or another way to say that is this. Paul lays down his rights so that others could pick up theirs. And Paul does this, you'll notice, in a few different ways. Just real quick, this is a kind of an overview of Paul's approach to ministry. Uh, We see him do this. He makes himself a servant to all. He says in verse 19, Uh, though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all, a servant to all. And you look at Paul's life, he didn't just say that, he demonstrated it. He really did. And then we see him adapting to different contexts to actually reach diverse audiences, right? And so uh, the scripture says, uh, to those under the law, I became as one under the law. To those under the, outside the law, I became as one outside the law. To the weak, I became weak. He's walking into different rooms, and he's, he's not just doing the same method. He's got the same message, but the message can't change. The methods always change. You walk into a room, and you have to consider the people that you're talking to, their background, their experience, and that's what Paul did. And then finally, he goes the extra mile, which is actually one of our core values here at Crosstown. For the sake of Christ's mission, he says, I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. And then later, he says in verse 26 and 27, you won't see this on the screen, but he says, I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one, you know, just beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. He disciplined himself to go beyond just what was required so that others could come to know Christ. And why does he do these things? So that others could be won to Christ. He does all three of these things so that others could be won to Christ. And then listen to how, um, (coughs) so we've looked at Paul's rights, we've looked at Paul's surrender, and, and we've looked at Paul's ministry. Now I want you to look at how this applies to our life. In other words, Paul has, has, has showed us what he wants us to know about himself. And then he says, here's what I want you to do with your life. Listen how Paul closes out this section in chapter 9. He says, um, well, let, let, me, let, me, let me first say this. There's three words that come to mind for application. Run to win. Run to win. Okay, so listen to how Paul closes out uh, 1 Corinthians 9. He says, do you not know that in a, in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. We're not out for a joy ride. We're not out for a happy jog. We're not out running aimlessly. No, we're in a race. And we want to win that race. And we want other people to win that race as well. You know, for the football fans out there uh, today, you may remember uh, the name Herm Edwards. Uh, Herm Edwards was actually the former uh, coach of the New York Jets. Uh, and he famously said to a reporter after a tough game at a press conference, he said these words. You remember this? You play to win the game. Hello, you play to win the game. How many of you remember that? Yeah, the the sports fans probably do. It's kind of a famous quote. Well, if Paul were to have a press conference with these Corinthian Christians, he might say something similar. He, He might say this. You live to run the race. Hello, you live to run the race. He wants us to run our race. So you have to know what that is. Why, why do you run? Why do you serve? You know, why do you give yourself to the gospel? We do those things. We run to win others to Christ for the sake of the gospel so that God would be glorified. That's why we run. And so again, let's ask the question that I posed at the beginning of the message. What race are you truly running. What race are you truly running? 
The reality is many people are running the race, the wrong race, chasing after the wrong things in life. So for example, I'll just give you a few examples. Some people are chasing after their career. You know, if I could just get the right job, then I would feel like I'm winning. Or relationships. If I just met that special someone, then I would feel like I'm winning. Or how about approval? If I could just get that person's attention, if I could just get that person to like me, if I could just get their approval, winning, right? Or maybe security, financial security. If I, if I could just feel a little bit more financially secure and stable, winning. Or how about significance? I could just feel a little bit more important, a little bit more needed. Winning, you know, reminds me of that stupid Charlie Sheen video, winning. Oh, it's horrible. Um, But listen, your career, your relationships, having a sense of approval, security, and significance, none of those things are necessarily bad in and of themselves, but you need to know that that type of race, chasing after these things will wear you out. Those Things cannot be our number one pursuit. They may be a part of your life, but they should not be your number one pursuit. Your number one pursuit should be Jesus, the gospel, and sharing it with other people. Now, some of the things that I mentioned here are gonna, they're gonna come as a result or afterwards of chasing after the right things, but Paul's point is that the first things need to be first. Isn't isn't that what Jesus said, by the way? In Matthew chapter six, verse 33, he said, he said, but seek first, his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, when you run the race that Paul is describing here in 1 Corinthians chapter nine, God will take care of the things that he desires and he wills for your life. You won't have to worry about it. He'll take care of it. Because at the end of the day, the goal for us is not an earthly pursuit, but an imperishable pursuit prize. I mean, imagine giving your life to your career. Imagine giving your life to chasing after a relationship or seeking approval from others or wanting security and significance. Just to stand on the winner's stand of the world and be giving a medal that's corroded. Imagine giving your life to all those things and standing on the winter stand to be given a wreath that's gonna wither and fade away. It's not worth it. That's the wrong pursuit. Those are perishable prizes, but we're running after something so much more valuable. I don't know if you remember the the movie Chariots of Fire. It was a film made in 1981. I was one years old at the time, but... um, You may have seen it since then. It won seven Oscars, including Best Picture, and it's famous for telling the story of a guy named Eric Liddell, uh, the Flying Scotsman, as he was called, uh, in the 1924 Olympics. And there's this scene in the film where Liddell is running a 440-yard sprint dash. This was 1923. And he's knocked down to the ground after the first few strides. Game over. The sprint is over, he's gonna lose, but he gets up and he starts running as fast as he possibly can and to everyone's surprise, he actually wins the race. Now, while the film focuses more on uh, on the the events leading up to 1924, at the end of the film, when Liddell and and the other runners are on the beach, at the end of the film, there's this line that, that shows how Liddell's life ended up. And it says this, Eric Liddell, missionary, died in occupied China at the end of World War II. All of Scotland mourned. All of Scotland mourned. Liddell went on to be a missionary, um, as some of you know, to China. His life ambition was not merely running races, but running the race to know Christ and to win others to Christ. In fact, there was a man named uh, David Mitchell, Uh, who was a missionary child in the internment camp where Liddell died in China. And Liddell wrote these words of, uh, Mitchell wrote these words of Liddell, and he said, none of us will ever forget this man who is totally committed to putting God first. A man whose humble life combined muscular Christianity with radiant godliness. And what was his secret? 
This is what Mitchell said. He said, the secret is this. He unreservedly committed his life to Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. As a Christian, Eric Liddell's desire was to know God more deeply and as a missionary, to make him known more fully. Crosstown, whether it's following the example of the Apostle Paul or Eric Liddell here, our calling is to take what we value most, knowing Christ, making him known, sharing the gospel, winning others to Christ, to take what we value most and to live life accordingly. So let me close by asking maybe some application questions that might be helpful. For those of you who are in the sermon-based small group, you'll be able to review these questions this week as you gather together and discuss these. For others who are not in a sermon-based small group, you might want to just snap a picture of the questions on the screen that I'm going to go over or download the notes on our app. But I think these questions will be very helpful as we take inventory of what we value most, defining it, and then setting those spiritual disciplines, those life disciplines according to what we value most. So here's the questions. Obviously, what matters to you the most? And and do you organize your life around what matters most? What matters to you most? And are you organizing your life around what matters most? Here's another question I think is important. Where do you feel like you're running aimlessly? Paul says, I do not run aimlessly. But there's certain... There's certain times in our life, if we're honest, where we're running aimlessly without purpose, especially God's purpose for our life. And then go back there, uh, previous slide. Are you running after things that in the grand scheme of things really don't matter, right? That's a good question. And then finally, uh, are there things that you need to let go of so that you can pick up the things that you should be doing for the sake of of the gospel or that you could be doing. Sometimes we can't pick up something unless we put something down. What is that for you? Um, Take some time this week to really consider those questions, especially in light of what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 9. I want to invite the worship teams to come forward as we pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you for the example of Paul and his life. If there's anyone who had rights uh, as the, uh, the apostle that you used to plant all these churches and to write the majority of the New Testament, certainly it was him, but I love the posture, Lord. We're learning from the posture of the apostle Paul that he surrendered those, lights, he, he, those rights, he laid them down. He laid them down so that others could pick up theirs. Help us follow his example, Lord. We have a ministry, we have a purpose, we have a calling on our lives, and it might not be a church planner, a missionary, a preacher, but it is to surrender to surrender what we could take hold of so that others could actually take hold of what they need, so that others could be one to Christ. That is our desire. So as a church, we just beg you that you would help us be people who share the gospel, who love you, and who love others in a way that people's hearts are turned to want to follow you as their Lord and Savior. May we see all kinds of people one to Christ. Help us keep our focus on that. And it's in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Amen. I love the way Pastor Jeremy just puts it in a very practical application. Just recently in our small group, uh, our end times and new beginning small group, we studied the moment that all believers will face one day up in heaven. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. At that moment, your salvation is not going to be judged, but what will be judged is the things that you have done down here on earth for the Lord Jesus Christ and the motives behind those things. And I, I look at that moment as you're standing before this one who you say that is your first love that you have fallen in love with, and you're looking at him straight in the eyes, your eyes connecting with his, And here is your moment when all of heaven is looking at this moment. All your works are going to be brought before this this moment. And whatever is done for the Lord Jesus Christ will turn it with a good motive because you love him. Will turn out to be gold, silver, and precious stones. And those that you have done for the Lord uh, with not the right proper motives will be wood, hay, and stubble. And there will be a fire that will, will be there and consume all that. And whatever is left over will be the good 
uh, the good things that you have done with the right motives for the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll be represented by the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. But I thought about that moment, and I'm thinking a little bit more deeper into it. This is your moment to tell Jesus, Jesus, I love you, and here's my proof. And a lot of Christians take that moment not as serious as they should. So as Pastor Jeremy's pounding away at, at us to, to examine, what are we living for? Are we living for all these different things? Now, don't get him wrong. There's nothing wrong with pursuing security and financial stability, but what he was stressing is make first things first. Kind of like Solomon. Solomon realized after all these aspirations, all these things he tried to do, uh, it had no connection. His motives had no connections between him and God. And then he realized at the end of life that that was so wrong. So whatever you do, make sure you, you're doing it because you love the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's my prayer that all of us will be standing there one day before the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll be a happy moment. It'll be a joyful moment where you'll say, Lord, I love you, and here is the proof. Now, when you make that decision, you're going to face battles. It's not an easy one. Everybody faces all kinds of battles in life. It seems every time you make a right decision, the enemy is right there to discourage you. But we know that we've got the Lord that fights on our side. Amen. So let's all stand and let's sing, Battle Belongs.
it for the Lord. Amen. Hey, we've got a great Savior to fight for us. Amen. Have a great Sunday. Lord bless you. And uh, Lord willing, we'll see you next Sunday. Thank you.